This is Dana McClendon, host of Ready for Trial. Today I sit down with Philip R. Newman, one of the founding partners of the law firm of Perrier Newman & Morton in Franklin, Tennessee. I think in this interview you'll come to understand why Phil is known as one of the best domestic relations lawyers and mediators in Middle Tennessee. I hope you enjoy. I'm here with my friend, colleague, Phil Newman. This is Dana McClendon, and this is Ready for Trial. Um, I'm going to sit down today with Phil Newman. Phil practices family law, including divorce and post-divorce proceedings, child support and parenting plan modifications, parental relocations, and juvenile court matters. You are also famously known as a Rule 31 mediator. People line up to get that from you. Um, you have uh, successfully mediated over 250 cases. I bet it's more by now. It's probably more by now. I've been mediating cases for, I think, well over a decade. Okay. We'll come back to that. Uh, Phil got his law license in 1993, so we've been at this a while. We've been doing it for, I think, about 27 years. Yeah. Um, you started out at Manier, Harrod, Hollibaugh, and Smith in Nashville, and then a few years later, you and uh, your current partner, Mark Perrier, came down here and founded um, Perrier, Perrier and Newman, now Perrier, Newman, and Morton. Um, been doing Perrier, Newman, and Morton since 2000. I think so. Mark and I started down here in 1994. Eight, I believe, and then Chaz Morton joined us about two years later, and so we've all been together um, for close to, I think, 22 years. All right, um, and you practice all over Middle Tennessee um, in the trial courts and courts of appeal and even the Tennessee Supreme Court. Raised in Brentwood, Tennessee, you and your wife and your sons live in Nashville, and uh, we'll cover some of the things you like to do when you're not doing this. Um, how you been, man? I haven't seen you in a while. I've been good. It's uh, been working from home most of the time. It's kind of nice to get back into the office and to establish some sense of professional normalcy um, in my uh, work life again. Yeah, I have. Uh, the other day, I was compelled to go to Clarksville for court, and uh, it was all that. It was the first time I'd been in a car on the interstate uh, driving in months. I, I actually, when I got in the car, I actually had the same gas in my car that I had bought in the first week of March. Now, I will say that um, the commute from Nashville to Franklin and back has been very nice when right, you come into work because there's been no traffic. Right, and so uh, maybe maybe some of that will persist. Um, well, let me ask you this, Bill. How did you become, how did you decide to be a lawyer? You know, uh, I am not one of these who planned his whole life to be a lawyer. True story. I was uh, on a trip after college across the country um, staying at various places on the way, gone for about three weeks, and I was staying with some friends in Vail, Colorado, and I had an epiphany one night looking at the stars in Vail because I had a friend whose brother was a lawyer, and I knew that my law partner, Mark Perrier, who was a fraternity brother of mine, was a first-year law student, and I thought, I like to read, I like to write, I think I just might go to law school. So it was really as simple as that. Someday I'll tell you the story of how I became a lawyer. It was it was even more reluctant than that. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think people don't know about what it's like to be a lawyer? You know, it's interesting. Or a trial lawyer, I should say. I, I, I tell people all the time that when you're in law school, pressed, they're like, wow, you're going to law school, you're working hard, you're studying, um, you're reading, you're writing. The day you graduate, you're just another damn lawyer. Right. I think that people probably may not realize how hard lawyers work, how much most lawyers care. Trial lawyers, I think people probably don't realize that can be a pretty stressful job, um, particularly in the line of work that I do a lot, mostly family law. You know, if you're going to trial in a case, um, there are some pretty important issues that are really going to affect people's lives for many, many years to come. And that weighs on lawyers, I think. I, I think it does. Um which leads perfectly to the next question is in 27 years since 1993 is there a case that you look back and it haunts you to this day um you know it sort of depends there are cases that i've settled before trial that i look back on and think we should have tried that case um but that's easy to say it, it is it is um there are cases that i've tried that i look back and think that uh I still don't quite agree with what the judge did. Perhaps it went up on appeal. Um, but you have to be able to let those things go. And as a trial lawyer, um, we don't make the facts. We take the facts as they're given to us. 
and we do the best we can and and generally you know we're lucky because we have good judges here in franklin and nashville too that that will try their best to be fair and sometimes it doesn't go your client's way yeah there's a couple that that have kind of lingered with me but so what does a good day in court look like for you uh motion day or trial so just uh, when you leave the courthouse and you feel like wow i'm glad i do this and that went well what is that well if it's what goes into that what and 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 what makes that your sense leaving I think if you, whether it's a, a detailed motion hearing about an important issue while a divorce case is pending or whether it's a trial, I think if you've gone to court and, and you feel like you were properly prepared, as, as prepared as you could be, and you feel like your client was prepared, you talked to all the witnesses, and the judge heard your case, and the judge heard your client, and however the judge ruled, usually the judge splits the baby, so to speak. You get some things you want, some things you don't want. But if your client feels like he or she was heard and the judge tried to be fair, um, that's, that's about the best you can expect for, I think. It's a hard-fought case. It's not personal between lawyers. And I think that's something that people that don't do what we do don't understand. Like you and I, have a, if we have a case where we're opposite each other, and we, the minute we see each other in the courtroom, we're like, well, how you doing? How's the boys and how's the wife and everything? We talk, you know, like we're friends and your client is sitting over there or my client is sitting over there thinking, why is he so friendly with that guy? That guy sucks. I don't I, like that guy. There is an old lawyer in Nashville, Dave Rutherford, who is a Nashville legend, who told me many years ago, we had a small claims court general sessions case and I was a brand new lawyer and we were talking to each other, cutting up before we went to trial. And he told me, he said, Phil, I've gotten fired by clients for doing exactly what we're doing right now. He said, because clients sometimes think all the lawyers are in it together with the judges. Right. And and so I tell my clients, you may see me, if I've got a case with you, Dana, you may, I tell my client, you may see me talk to Dana during the motion docket. I have a good relationship with him. We fuss and fight in cases, but I can get a better result from you if I can go to him and talk to him. And if I've cultivated that relationship where right. there's a problem, we can work it out. But clients don't understand how you can go take a deposition and fuss and fight, maybe yell a little bit. And 30 seconds later, we're talking about whatever, and, unrelated to the practice. And shake hands afterwards and go on. I've often likened it to sports. You're right. The, the trial practice, I call it between the lines, right? As long as you're ethical and you're fair to me, you're not sneaky, you don't hide things, it's all between the lines. If we fuss and fight and have a difficult case and argue in court and get after it, when we leave, it stays in the courtroom. Yeah, I, I think that's true. and. and I tell clients all the time that I have to go back. I have to go deal with Phil or one of our other colleagues. I have to go see that judge again. And part of what you get when you hire me and part of what you get when you hire Phil is you get that collective accumulated reputation for being either being either a reasonable, honest, you know, straight up, squared away person or not. Um, and the client either gets the benefit of it if you've done it right, or the client suffers the consequences for showing up with someone who doesn't. I, I, th I think so. I tell clients all the time, you want a lawyer, in my view, who will work as hard to settle your case as he or she will to try your case. You want a lawyer who will do that and will work hard and fight when he or she has to, but, but can get along with other lawyers and the judge. One of our judges said one time in the last couple of years, that a lawyer can spend 20 years building a reputation and 20 minutes losing it. Yeah, if, if that. It, it, sure. it, I think I've seen it evaporate faster than that, right? It, I think it can happen. Yeah. So what does a bad day look like? Uh, a bad day in court would be probably if something came up that I didn't anticipate, which almost always happens in trial, but if it um, materially affected the outcome, uh, an especially bad day is if I felt like a judge wasn't listening to my client or letting me... Um, Clients hate that. That's right, letting the client be heard. Occasionally, not with the judges we have now, you may feel like a judge has prejudged your case. And you've got, there used to be a, well, uh, <laughs> there used to be a judge in Nashville, not there anymore, but that you would to go... To be fair, in, there are judges all over the place. That's true, that, that, but you would go into court and you would feel like the first five minutes into an hour-long hearing... You were behind the eight ball. Yeah, sometimes with, I know who you're talking about. Sometimes with that judge, it was over the minute 
one of the little click lawyers said something negative or nasty about your client. That was it. As that was a that from then on that was chiseled in stone fact. If that's right. So and so got up and said, "Well, your honor, this man or this woman did this." Whether that happened or not, the judge never, never, ever thought it didn't happen. Or if it was in a pleading, which is just an allegation. As <laughs> right. I recall, in one of your cases involving this particular judge, um, he or she, the judge, made a comment that if he or she could wave a magic wand and make your client disappear, that's what he or she would yeah, do. Yeah, I didn't try that case. I took it on appeal. But, that's um, right. And, and one of our other colleagues tried that case, and the judge was just... Um, well, the court of the court of appeals reversed the trial judge's decision in that case, and then sua sponte, meaning on their own without anyone asking, took that judge off the case and remarked that that judge had clearly demonstrated that that judge could not be fair to my client. And, and that that's a great point because what I think as a lawyer you want a you want a judge who will read whatever you filed if you filed it timely, pretrial brief, motion, response to a brief, will listen to all the proof not prejudge it and and be fair. And clients want to feel like they were treated fairly. And some judges are really good at delivering uh, a bad message to a client. They, right. will, they will say things like, uh, Mr. Smith, um, your lawyers had a very good presentation today, but here's how the law requires me to rule. Right. You just aren't there yet, or you That's didn't right. have this, or yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with you that when, when a client has spent the time and the money and the emotional capital to go to the courthouse. It's a disaster when they leave feeling like the judge just waved their hand and sent them away. And that, dismissed them, was dismissive and, just, yeah. and didn't really hear them. And I think, I mean, it requires um, on the family docket a tremendous amount of patience, tremendous amount of patience on the judge's part because they hear um, a lot of difficult issues. Some are recurring and to make each client feel like they're being heard or each party, each litigant, that's a talent. Um, and some judges can do it better than others, but I, I hate when a client comes to me and perhaps they want me to be the second or third lawyer in. Yeah, it's always, a, it's always and, a good, you always have to wonder about that's that. That's right. right. And, but they feel like that the justice, the court system has just turned its back on them. And I hate to hear about when they feel like their lawyer mistreated them or the judge did. Sometimes it didn't happen. It usually didn't happen, but I hate when somebody feels that way because it's a reflection on all of us. So I, I, I've come, I've got some rules of thumb, and one of them is anyone can get divorced once. A lot of people can get divorced twice. If you get divorced three times, I'm looking at you. <laughs> and the same thing about lawyers, right? Like sometimes people go and hire a lawyer, and for whatever reason, that relationship doesn't work out well. They just don't click. And they don't click, or there's a hard, there, there's a there's a bad result that is maybe the lawyer's fault or maybe not the lawyer's fault, but, you know, sometimes we get clients that don't accept a lot of responsibility for the situation sure. they've created. So anyone can have one lawyer, right? Lots of people might end up with two, but if you're shopping for your third lawyer, I'm looking at you. No, I, I completely agree, and sometimes I'll look at who the lawyer is they're changing from. Always. Because I, I've done this long enough. I know the lawyers who are reasonable yep. are good to work with. What do you think? There's 30 or 40 of us that do this all the time in the courthouse right across the street? Pro probably. And we and know each other. That's right. And and if I see someone who's left a really good lawyer, I'm probably looking at you. Right. And I will interrupt people. They'll call me and they'll go, i got to get a new lawyer. I, I, they may still be talking. I go, stop. Who's been representing you? And then the next question is, Who's on the other side? And the, who's been representing you is so that I know if I even want to entertain the idea of replacing that lawyer. And who's on the other side, really, I'm asking to get an idea of how much of a headache is this going to be? Does this fit into my life right now? And, sure. and is it worth it? Because we all, we, all we all sometimes get dealt the opposing counsel that just makes things difficult. That's true. I'll, I'll almost always tell someone who calls me that the first thing you should try and do is to work out your differences with your current lawyer. Right. Because um, get a meeting with them, tell them what your concerns are, see if y'all can still work together. Because if they do come and retain me and I take the case, they're going to have to pay me to get up to speed on it. I can't possibly know the case as well as their current lawyer does. Sometimes it's a communication issue. 
Yeah, sometimes I, I do think that there's a good opportunity for people to change lawyers when, when the client has made a mistake and maybe gotten bad advice and you mix those two things up and then the client goes and gets hammered at the courthouse. Sometimes I think changing a lawyer gives that client an opportunity to rehabilitate themselves. Like the, 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 it's difficult for the lawyers to say, we should do this different next time. That didn't work. So sometimes lawyers kind of get stuck. And other, some, I've had plenty of conversations where I say to somebody, you know what, how'd that work out for you? Not good? Okay, here's what I would do if I were your lawyer, and we need to re rehabilitate you. I, and I think sometimes clients are more willing to listen if they've been with the lawyer and haven't gotten a result on an issue or a motion in court, and perhaps they didn't listen as well as they could have, and they come to see you, and they're in a place where they're more willing to listen to we should do it a different way, have a different approach. Um, sometimes, for some reason, a lawyer's gotten crossways with a judge. Perhaps something wasn't filed on time or um, he or she wasn't prepared. And sometimes a, a fresh look at it helps a client in terms of how the judge views the case, I think. Yeah. So what's the funniest thing you've ever seen happen at the courthouse? The funniest thing I've ever seen happen in a courthouse is a, uh, well, there's a lot of funny things. Uh, uh, a lawyer friend of ours um, who's deceased wore one day years ago a, uh, he was a great guy he wore a jacket into court one day that was just a bright red uh, metallic looking jacket it was a full courthouse full courtroom on a domestic motion day and um, our judge Judge Lee Davies was on the bench and, and when he just got ready to call the docket, he looked at this lawyer who was about 6'3", big guy, and he said, uh, I don't know whether to call your case or ask you to show me to my seat. I remember. I, and, I've heard uh, that story. you were there, I maybe. I and, don't know if, I, you know, sometimes in your memory puts you in places you weren't or yeah. excuses you from places that you were, but I've heard the story from multiple sources. Yeah, they, uh, they're all, they're, yeah, some of those things, they're good stories I've heard, and there are things that I saw, you know, good days and bad days in court. I always watch out for the bag of crazy. So this is the pro se litigant, the, the person who shows up with no lawyer, and they have a beach bag with a <laughs> hundred dog-eared pages, coffee stained, and when they get up to the podium, they start rifling through it as if any minute now I'm going to find the thing. I've been there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's when I get up and leave. Like, if it's not my case, I just get up, because I know that what's about to ensue is 30 minutes of nothing I want to watch. Well, that's true. I mean, we had a guy years ago in a juvenile court case, and he was a pro se litigant, and um, he would file just all of these pleadings every other day. We would get hand delivered to us by him, stacks and stacks of pleadings and medical records, just nonsense, and documents, sure. nonsense, improperly filed um, stuff the court couldn't consider. But we'd bring him in, and we'd get him, and they would just reek of cigarette smoke. Oh. Um, and you know, we would know what it was when it came in the door. I got a book like that off of eBay. I got a Shakespeare. I got a hardback Shakespeare book, and it's uh, when I got it, I, I realized I had not carefully scrutinized that ad. That's right. So, That's right. Well, so let's talk about your mediation practice okay. because I don't mind telling you. I like to say nice things to people. Uh, people wait weeks and weeks and weeks to get on your mediation docket, um, as you. The hundreds of cases you've mediated. I've lost count of the number of times I've spent a d all day or all day and into the evening with you to mediate a case. Why do you think people wait that long to get a, to get in to see you? And what is it that makes you different or, let's say, better than some of the other people doing it around town? Well, first of all, I'm a big believer in the mediation process. There are a lot of good mediators. Were you at the beginning? Did you uh, did you I, sign up? Did you did you like were you invested in mediation when I, they started I, making us do I it? I was. I think you and I are of a generation that was more open minded to mediation. I wasn't. I hated it. You and I, I, I did not want to go to another lawyer's office and 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 tell someone who could not give me a result. I didn't want to spend a day with someone who couldn't finish the case for me. Well, I think but for me, I'm, maybe I'm lazy or maybe I'm just. But I, I've totally changed my mind now. I think it's, I, I wish that we had done it sooner, and I and I wish that, um, I wish that more people had embraced it sooner. If you look back 15, 20 years ago, we first began to do mediation as a form of alternative dispute resolution, civil cases like personal injury cases, slip and falls, car wrecks, those cases were easy. 
an insurance adjuster comes to the office, they're in different rooms, they go back and forth, and it's about how much are they going to pay to settle a case. Oftentimes, not a lot of emotion involved. At least on one side. On one side, correct. Um, when we began to do it in domestic cases, a lot of our old school judges who are now retired, our old school domestic lawyers thought this is not going to work. Um, kind of the same thing you did. It became apparent pretty quickly mediation was a great way to clean up the court's docket that people wanted to resolve cases, it kept them out of court, it saved on fees, and um, it became apparent, I think, pretty quickly that this is a great way to resolve difficult, emotionally charged cases if you do it right. So, but why are people waiting weeks? To, like, if I called today and I said, hey, I need a, I need a mediation day, I might get some sooner because of the, the coronavirus problem, but like, generally speaking, it's six, eight, ten weeks. Well, um, and good for you, by the way. No, well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think every mediator has his or her own style. I think my style is I like to connect with people. I'm genuinely interested in every person that walks in here that I'm going to mediate for because they always have a story to tell. Maybe they collect guns. Maybe they um, are hunters. Maybe um, she's a writer. Maybe um, she's a songwriter. Um, but, but they always have interesting stories. And I think my personality, I like people. I like to connect with people, and I feel like part of my job in helping folks, you know, our, our model in our geographic area is people are in different rooms. Um, they teach you in training, media training, not to do that. That's the way it's evolved over time. Uh, yeah, that, that in a divorce case, that's almost got to be the way it's That's done. right. And so what happens is my challenge throughout the day is to connect with, with both sides so that when we get close to getting a deal done, I can hopefully have some credibility built up to say this is something I think that's in the that's ballpark. That's when you give them the Phil show. That's right, the ballpark. That it's in the realm of what the court might do, and, and the case probably needs to be settled. I can't advise them. I'm not their lawyer. But I think because I try cases, I don't only do mediations. I think I have credibility with lawyers, and they know that I've got a pretty good feel for what the judges will do. Um, if I've got a, you know, a great mediation, the lawyers work with you and not against you. Um, you know, I can pull the lawyers out and talk to them. And you asked me a question, what's a great day in trial? Well, here's a question, what's a, what's a great mediation? Right? When you leave with everything signed. Well, that and more, though. To me, as a media, when I mediate... And it's I, a durable I, it's I a think durable a, piece. A, a great mediation for me is when we get done, and yes, we have a signed deal, we've got a global settlement, we reach an agreement, it's drafted, the parties sign it. It was typically a tough and a long day, they don't love the deal, but they've got closure, and they like enough of it, and they know it's in their best interest. They enjoyed the process as much as they can. I get a handshake or a hug, and they're so relieved. And as you said, it's durable. They've reached an agreement with their usually spouse or ex-spouse, and they've collaborated to an extent, and they both bought in. They did it together. And they can leave with the satisfaction that... Um, it's something that will last. And I know as a, as a lawyer, trial lawyer, and a mediator, I've done a service to them because they're not going to have to take depositions. As expensive as mediation is, it's cheaper than trial. Uh, of course. And the emotional cost of trial is tremendous on families. Oh, yeah. So, that's scorched earth. That's right. And so if I've helped them avoid that, I think I've really added value to their lives is the way I approach it. Yeah. So I will tell you that I think one of the things that makes you really good at it is that you do have a broad spectrum of connectability. Like you, there are certain cases that, that I'm thinking about my client, I need a mediator who is soft, or I need a mediator who's gonna get in this person's face and tell them, you're gonna, get, you're gonna lose, you're not gonna get anything like the thing you think you're gonna get. You know, so different mediators fit different sure. cases better. But I think you you can pretty much take any kind of case and and adjust to that. Some people only have one I, one act. I, I know that's a good point. Judge Smith in Nashville asked me one time at a seminar. He said, "Mr. Newman, do you match up your cases with mediators?" I said, "Of course, doesn't everybody?" Right. I could I pick judges if I could. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I do, but I'd like to think I try hard to be able to. Um, prepare for a case in a way that I know what this lawyer needs. Law Here's one thing people don't know. Lawyers, trial lawyers, love to settle cases. That's something folks don't know. They love to settle cases because they're stressful and expensive. And so preparation for a mediator is key. Uh, people know I pull all the pleadings in a case. I read them all because I don't always get them from the lawyers. I get asked for really detailed mediation packages 
to give me their confidential, a feel for what's happened in the case. I'll oftentimes call the lawyers and say, what can I do to help us get this case resolved? What could you not put in your mediation package? What do I right. need to know about your client? Right. About what is it you, side? Yeah, assuming that you sent the mediation package to your client, what is it that you didn't say That's right. that would be helpful? Yeah, and how can I connect with your client? Right. I, I tell the story all the time. This is, this is, I think, in a nutshell, the way I mediate. I had a guy in this room we're in right now um, a few years ago, and we'd established through the course of, of – of our conversation that he was a runner. Well, I'm a runner. And I figured out that he had run in the Boston Marathon during uh, when it was bombed. And, and I've been running for 30 years. And so I said to this guy, I said, um, well, you, you had to qualify for Boston, didn't you? He said, as a matter of fact, I did. His face kind of lit up because I knew right. about this, about running. That's why I tried for three years. I said, what was your time? 325, 330. And I knew roughly what he would have needed. So, well, yeah, it was. And I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, it must have been horribly upsetting to work so hard over four or five years to qualify for Boston, to make it and to have that happen and to sort of mar this event you'd worked for so hard. And at that point, his eyes lit up, tears in his eyes. And he told me, he said, nobody's ever understood that before today. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I thought if I can connect with him at that level, we're going to get this case settled. Right. And we did. Yeah. So uh, you talked about running. So how do you keep the work-life balance in order? Well, that's a great question. Um, that is something that all lawyers probably battle. Certainly all trial lawyers battle and family lawyers battle because um, you've got to be able to, in my view, to leave your work at work as much as you can and have some kind of an outlet I have to anyway to maintain sanity. Um, I've got 12 and 8-year-old boys. I have a wife who's a lawyer as well. When I go home, I spend my day telling people what to do, right? <laughs> Mediating or as a trial right. lawyer. Um, and I've got to take that hat off when I get home, and, and I don't get to tell my wife what to do. But, you know, <laughs> running for me has been an outlet. It's my time. If I go out and run four miles or six miles or whatever I'm doing, and I listen to a podcast or music, it's my time to unwind. And... I've learned about myself. I've got to have that, right? I'm pretty good at leaving work at work. As a trial lawyer, there's going to be weekend work sometimes if the trial's coming up. You can't avoid that. Um, but I've learned, for the most part, to leave it at home, at work when I need to. Um, you've got to care about your client in this line of work, but you can't care too much that you lose your objectivity, right? Yeah. It's, I tell people it's kind of like being a surgeon. You want the surgeon focused on the surgery. That's right. Right. Oh, my, I was at a class. Uh, I do a lot of sh tactical shooting, and I was at a class, and um, my friend and I that, I that I went with, we were talking about, well, out of everyone in this class, who would you want to take the, the hostage shot? You know, like the shot where they have to shoot over your shoulder, you know. And, it, um, and I said I'd pick him. And my friend, who's a really, really good shooter, thought, he was offended, you know, and I was like, no, why didn't you pick me? Yeah. He was like, why didn't you pick me? And I said, I didn't pick you because you've had dinner with my wife. That guy's a great shooter. You're a great shooter. But that guy doesn't know my wife. If you were taking the shot, part of your bandwidth would be, would be thinking about my family. He doesn't have that burden. That's he, right. he can come at it strictly from a take care of the business type thing. And I think... It's difficult when we, you know, we know people for months and months when we do these divorce cases. It's difficult to not become invested in their life and in their... It's hard. And it's it's hard when you feel like you have a party who is genuinely aggrieved. And if you have a case that goes to trial, it's probably a year and a half deal. And you develop an affinity for the client and you, you feel compassion and empathy for them. But you can't let it affect your objectivity because you may need to tell your client in the case... I know you want your day in court, but people always want their day in court until they get it, we right. say. yeah. But you say to your client, we need to settle this case now and save money and not take the risk, and it's what's best for you. So yeah. hopefully what you do as a lawyer is you build, almost like a mediator, you build up that credibility over time yeah. by being there for your client, not getting so wrapped up you lose your ability to be objective. Yeah, so right? I, I tell people all the time that the very first time they talk to me, I'm going to tell them as bad as it is, right? Flat out. 
this is the worst thing you'll ever hear from me. Here's what could happen. You could spend tens of thousands of dollars. You could go through very painful, litigious stuff. You could go to trial. And you it might could, take two years to get there. It might take two years to get there. I'll have a lot of your money. And then you could walk out of the courthouse and wish that you had taken the deal that was offered to you 18 months ago. That's right. Like desperately wish that you could that's take right. it. So that's, and I tell people, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not your cheerleader, right? The good news is I will never tell you anything worse than this unless something happens or unless there's some huge thing you've left out of this story. But this is what it could be. So, you know, if, if other lawyers want to be a cheerleader and, and just tell you something that you want to hear to get paid, well, one day you'll have the hard conversation with them too. But it's, I think our, you, know, you and I have been doing this for the exact same amount of time. Our, pro, our, our careers are fairly similar. Our approaches are very similar. I, I've had multiple clients tell me or, or post on our website that something along the lines of, Phil Wooden always told me what I needed, what I wanted to hear. He told me what I needed to hear. Yeah, and people, and, and people confuse the two. They do. How many times have you had somebody say to you, I thought you were supposed to be on my side? Uh, well, I am on your side, but the video is <laughs> what it is, right? It's bad, right? I am on your side. I'm trying to get you to make a decision so that we don't have to show that video to the judge. That's right. And, and I, I think, again, you build the credibility with your client over time by being there for him or her. Um, disagreeing with them when you need to. I think they respect you for it. Um, I tell clients all the time when, in the first meeting, if you want a yes man, that's not me. Right. Because I'm always going to tell you what I think. Right. I'm always going to be honest with you. And I can refer people to, to lawyers who will never tell them no. That's right. Yeah. Oh, you, you want to run off to court with this emergency or that, you know, perceived problem? Have, I will tell you who will be happy to write it all down and take it over there for you. That doesn't mean you're going to get the outcome you want, That's but right. if you don't, if you want a lawyer with absolutely no client control or interest in client control or filter, we have those. That we do. I, I, <laughs> I think people don't realize good trial lawyers are problem solvers. Yeah, that's I, I, I jokingly say to people that what do I do? Well, if you want it broken, I break it, and if you want it fixed, I fix it. <laughs> don't worry about the how, right? People call me all the time, and I'm sure they call you, and they say, "I want a bulldog." No. No, you want someone who can solve your problem. And sometimes that requires whatever bulldog is. And sometimes it requires finesse or, you know, uh, like saying no. I think uh, that's a good point. I think that I think a lot about what makes a good lawyer. One of the things that makes a good lawyer is he or she can use finesse or be a bulldog and knows which, situa which situation requires um, that right. skill. Can go into the courtroom, do the bulldog thing, walk out, say goodbye to that client, walk back in and plead for mercy. That's right. On behalf of another one. That's right. I had a, uh, you know, funny stories. I was taking a deposition with a, a good lawyer friend of ours in Nashville one day. And unbeknownst to me, my client had sent his wife, my client was being deposed actually, and he had sent his wife a couple emails that said, wait till my bulldog lawyer gets a, a, a hold of you. So, of course, the other lawyer, who's a good friend of mine, uh, pulls this email out, makes an exhibit, um, starts calling me bulldog for the rest of the deposition. This day, he still calls me that. But that was exactly what was going on. Clients will do that. And, you know, lawyers think it's funny because they kind of get it. But uh, we still laugh about that now. So if you weren't doing this, what would you – What if, if you weren't doing this – but whatever you pick would pay the same. What would you do? Whatever I would pick would pay the same. Yeah, hypothetically, you hypothetically. don't have to take a pay cut to do this uh, other thing that you would. That that's you would a great do. question. I, it's a it's a tough business to be in now, but I think I'd enjoy being a journalist, writing. Okay. Um, I started out in journalism in college. Um, I might. I, I worked in baseball for a while before law school. I might enjoy working in sports, but but I think probably. Uh, being some kind of a journalist or writer would be fun. My answer is fishing guide. Well, that's a good answer. That's yep. a good answer. I'd take people fishing who wanted to, like, I would prioritize, like, fathers and sons or mothers and daughters or, you know, like the family fishing trip. You know, that's that's a great point. I've coached, um, I coached both my boys in baseball. I think you used to coach football. I, I, coached, football. I coached both baseball and football. All right. So I've done, I've had the same group of my older ones, 12. I've had the same group of boys together now, fall and spring, 
since they were five. So that's probably roughly seven years, 14 baseball teams, not including all-star teams. So you'd be a professional little league coach. I've said if I, <laughs> I – seriously, I've said if I died and went to heaven, give me a fall baseball game when it's 65, 70 degrees outside, the sun's setting um, uh, over at the Evan Warner Park, and for eternity – I could just coach probably best age, probably 10, 11-year-old boys, 9 or 10, in baseball forever. That would be that would be where I would like to be. Yeah, so one of my favorite pictures that I ever took is take I took it from the dugout, and my older son is pitching and my younger son is catching. And I've got this kind of panoramic shot. And they were not able to play together until then because of the way the age brackets work. They're sure. 30 months apart. But um, I think I've shared this with you before. I... I look at coaching baseball, and there and there could be there's any number of things. Sure. But these days, youth athletics is the proxy for the things that you and I, as men and fathers, would have had to teach our children. You know, a thousand years ago, we would have been teaching them just survival, sure. right? Like how to grow food, or how to hunt, or how to make, you know, a lantern or whatever. And and by doing that. That you know, you would you ne- just to live, just to survive. You would have spent a lot of time mentoring not only your kid but well, someone else's is. kids, and so I never really cared what the score was. I mean, it's no fun to get your brains beat in. But I looked at every season and every game and every inning and every out as an opportunity to teach a, y- a young person life skills, a lesson about how to how to be graceful in winning or how to or how to be humble in defeat, or how to accept the fact that people make mistakes, your teammate, the umpire, your coach, That's whatever. Right. Um, so I always, you know, and, and when you're telling a 10-year-old that, they, they don't get it. But maybe one day, one of those 10-year-olds will look back and think, you know what, this was a lesson I learned at Jim Warren Park. I, I think, you know, we all have, we all remember, we're lucky if we have four or five teachers, I think, that made a lasting impact on your life. I think if you play sports, it's the same way with coaches. If there are two or three that you remember forever, and there's some that I remember, you know, I've always told my parents every year before a season starts, and I have generally this, our league lets us keep the same team together. It's not a travel team. It's recreational baseball for the most part with all-stars sprinkled in. But but I've told the parents that if, if a successful season is we teach the boys, they enjoy themselves, they learn about the game, learn about winning and losing, most importantly, they want to play again the next season. Yes. That's a successful season. Right. And, and that may mean you're 500. It may mean you're a little better. Maybe you have a great year or a bad year. But that's, to me, that's what... You need to lose some games because you don't want to peak at nine years old. That's right. <laughs> but that's what that's what recreational sports is about. And, and for me, too, you know, I always say I do this so I can do that, right? Right. I, I work hard so I've got the time... Um, and I can control my own schedule. Well, see, that was a question I wanted to ask earlier, and I forgot, which was, you know, when we got out of law school, you were in Knoxville and I was at Vanderbilt. Both of us started at big law firms in Nashville, bright, bright, eager, young, you know, lawyers. Big for then was about 50 lawyers. Now it's 250. Yeah, I think at the time when I joined the big law firm, I think my class was seven first-year lawyers, and they were scared and stunned. Like, everyone there was like, oh, my God, what do we do with seven baby lawyers? Sure, your firm was probably 80 lawyers. But at the time, it pushed it, that that seven pushed it over 40. Yeah, yeah. Now, within a couple of years, it was over 100. We were right about 40, and that was a big law firm for those days. Yeah, it used to be in Nashville that if you hit 50, you blew up. That's right. Like, that was critical mass. There was no, no law firm had ever, and then now it's not that way. But, but at the time, so the question I have is, what was it that led you to t- I mean when I got the job I got I was ecstatic I was like this Me is too. awesome corn I'm I'm on this partnership track I'm going to get a corner office and I'm going to join the country club and uh, blah blah and I'm going to send my kids to private school and blah, blah blah and I'll never forget one night I was working you know into the evening and I got a, I was sitting in a partner's office and you know when I had I, I worked for partners who wanted me there at seven in the morning and seven at night FaceTime right yeah, this was different then, right? You had to actually show up. And um, I was sitting downtown one night about 7.30, and the direct line on this partner's desk rang. And it was kid, It was his kid telling him about the double he had just hit and, you know, how excited he was to call his dad and tell him. And I remember thinking at that moment, if being – and this was a great law firm, and I have nothing but great things to say, 
But I remember thinking, if, if I'm on a path that leads to me not being at a ball game, is that really what I want to do? I had the almost, again, you and I are similar in a lot of ways, different than others, but I, I had a similar experience. A lawyer there who was a young partner that I admired very much. Uh, he's still a lawyer and he's a good friend. He taught me a lot about how to practice law. And I was at this particular firm for four and a half, five years. And um, I, I, when I work with the young lawyers now, a lot of things he taught me, I find that I teach them. Uh, but I would see him there late hours, Saturdays and Sundays, um, working, billing hours. And I thought to myself, and he was a young partner that, that ostensibly had it all. And I thought, I don't think I want that life. Right. Um, if I'm going to be married and have a family and be able to coach sports and do those kind of things, how can I do that um, if I'm in the office every Saturday from 8 to 2? Yeah, so you leave the law firm, the big law firm in the skyscraper, and you come down to Franklin and you set up shop. That's what I did. Well, I, I came to work for Ernie Williams. Great man. Oh, what a, the best. The, one of the most... One of the most fortuitous, lucky decisions I ever made was to go work with him. And so here we are. So that was, you know, late 90s. We decided to come down here, still young lawyers, and chart our own way. Knowing now what you know, are you glad you did all that? I am. I, I, think, I don't think I would change it. I think that having the, the training I got at the bigger firm, the support. Yeah, I don't know how – I don't know how – lawyers come out of law school That's right. and manage not only the practice of law, which is hard enough, but also the business of law and also the, the tensions that come with trying to make a living while doing good work ethically. The lawyers that mentored me, the Steve Coxes, the Randall Fergusons, the Mark Levans, the, the uh, uh, Mike Evans, these lawyers, um, Rowan Leathers that I learned from, learned about how to be a lawyer how to practice law, how to have some kind of work-life balance. Had I not done that, it would have been very difficult for me to start my own practice on my own or with Mark Career as I did. Like you, I'm amazed at lawyers that come down here or Nashville and start off on their own with no training. I think sometimes they struggle on how to get along well with other lawyers and how to, how to find the balance between um, being accommodating um, and not too litigious. That's a, a hard thing to learn on the fly. Yeah, um, be careful picking the reputation you're trying to make. That's right. That's yeah, that, that's, that's that's exactly right. And I think um, I wouldn't do it any other way. Um, I I learned quickly that I'm a better boss than I am an employee because I'm pretty. I'm opinion, terrible at both. I'm pretty opinionated. I would fire myself <laughs> if I could. <laughs> I, I, and and I I found at a bigger firm I was oftentimes um, uh, making my. Uh, opinion heard when I didn't need to <laughs> and so I think I'm better at being a boss than an employee and um, I like the mentoring of younger lawyers you know we've got six here and I'll have three lawyers that are younger than me and and I'm very very lucky to my law partners Mark Career and Chaz Moore two of my best friends and um, you know we're a true partnership we're not a we don't we're not sharing space we we own this building together we um, own a practice together and um, we've got a pretty unique setup um, and uh, I don't think I would change at all the way the way that I've done it. I'm very lucky. Yeah. So uh, I'll leave with this. Uh, best book you've read lately? Because I know you're a big reader. You know, the best book I've read lately, I read, for some reason, I went on a Rehnquist kick, and I read a couple books about um, Chief Justice Rehnquist. I love reading about the Supreme Court. So from a legal standpoint, um, both of those were very, very good. Um, uh, I read nonfiction and fiction, as you know. My son and I, my 12-year-old, they're being basically homeschooled now because of COVID-19. And so I told him he likes to read almost all sports books. And I said, well, let's read something else. And there's a series by, I think it's Philip Pullman, I think published in the mid-90s, Fantasy. I don't read a lot of fantasy. And it's called His Dark Matters. It's a trilogy. They've made that into a, a, a HBO movie. series. I, I think, yeah, an HBO series. And I believe the first one was called The Golden Compass or something of that nature. And so I told him, let's read this book together. And so daytime, you read two chapters. I'll read them at night. He started going for runs with me, so we talk about it on our runs in the mornings. And it's been great because 
it's the kind of book we don't, neither one of us usually reads, and we've had the best time talking about it. It's kind of like, I guess in some ways, like Harry Potter, I suppose. I've not read all those, but it's been a lot of fun, and so it's, a, I guess, a YA young adult book. And we've had the best time, had the best time reading that together. We're reading the second one together now. We're going to finish the series, I think, this spring. And uh, I think both of those are, are, are good books I've read recently. All right. Well, Phil, thanks for sitting down with me. Um, you can find Phil Newman at Perrier Newman and Morton in Franklin, Tennessee. Great lawyer, great mediator, um, and uh, someone that I refer people to all the time. Thanks for sitting down with me. Thanks, Dane. A lot of fun. Yeah, man. How about that?